We went from a rail served country to a auto dependent nation. We've become a car culture and it's hard to break out of that cycle. We've just gone through this, this tremendous transformation um, when it comes to travel. The North American freight rail network is considered the most efficient, the largest, and the most profitable freight rail network in the world. These kinds of services are, are critically important for helping the country move. Really, this is the time for rail travel. The United States lags behind the rest of the world when it comes to passenger trains. But when it comes to the freight railroad, the U.S. is dominating. The freight rail network in the U.S. operates over 140,000 miles of privately owned track in every state except for Hawaii. It moves one-third of all U.S. exports and roughly 40% of long-distance freight volume. The North American freight rail network is considered the most efficient, the largest, and the most profitable freight rail network in the world. It competes directly with the trucking industry to move goods around the country shipping everything from coal to cars to chemicals. And with the rise of e-commerce companies like Amazon, trains are increasingly moving consumer goods as well. If you see it on a shelf, we likely had a hand in moving it. There are seven major freight railroads that connect North America. Union Pacific and BNSF dominate the West. CSX and Norfolk Southern are the primary East Coast operators, while Kansas City Southern, along with Canadian Pacific and Canadian National, run routes north and south. Amtrak, which is the United States passenger service, owns only 3% of the country's rail. In 2019, the top five railroads in the U.S. had a total operating revenue of over $71 billion. BNSF, a subsidiary of Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, is not publicly traded, but the remaining four U.S. companies have seen their stock on a steady climb over the last several years. The railroads are incredibly profitable and actually are achieving profits that they've never seen in their entire history. That unfortunately is not true for passenger railroads. Amtrak continues to lose money. It's the only major for-profit railroad in the United States that hauls passengers, and yet it has never made a profit. The future of freight demand in this country is strong. Estimates of 30 to 40 percent increases in freight demand between now and the next few decades are prevalent. But the freight rail industry's success has not come without its challenges. The industry has dealt with bankruptcies, the lack of demand for coal, and the more recent supply chain bottlenecks and rise in thefts. The seven top railroads, which own the majority of the tracks in North America, have also been criticized for monopolistic power over the rail industry. They tend to be very oligopolic and have an enormous amount of power in pricing, and there isn't a lot of competition. CNBC explores how freight railroads became so profitable and how the industry plans to evolve to stay on top. The U.S. Railroad dates back to the year 1830, before airplanes or automobiles were even invented. Passenger rail and freight were in high demand to move people and things around the expanding country. It's been an economic backbone of the United States, and in many ways plays a core and central theme in American history, and particularly the state of the economy. The railroad has seen many high and low points. By 1917, 1,500 railroads operated on 254,000 miles of track. The 40s and 50s brought the rise of cars, air travel, and trucking. Up until that point, there was basically no competition for passenger or freight rail besides other railroad companies, and the industry was subject to federal regulation that set rates and profit levels. After World War II, the federal government built this incredible interstate highway network and really lit trucking on fire, but didn't relax the regulatory standards on the rail industry, even though the competition increased dramatically. It wasn't until 1980, when the Staggers Act was enacted, that these regulations were loosened. It allowed railroads to choose routes, prices, and services, and brought profits back to the railroads. Since then, many redundant routes and railroad mergers have consolidated the industry. There was a series of about five or six different mergers that allowed the Union Pacific to be the 32,000 miles mainline track that we see here today. Without M&A, chances are that rail as a percent of overall freight would be a much less important part of our domestic freight network. Kansas City Southern just recently agreed to merge with Canadian Pacific, and if the Surface Transportation Board approves, it will create the only railroad linking Canada, the U.S., and Mexico.
Today, the U.S. has some of the most profitable freight railroad businesses in the world, achieving billions in profits. Passenger rail, however, has not seen a similar comeback. While freight railroads have invested at least $25 billion a year, year over year, into their networks over the past several decades, passenger rail has not had the same level of benefit. When it comes to Amtrak, the federal government has traditionally been the primary funder of Amtrak, and the amount of funding pales in comparison to funding levels that have occurred in other countries. Experts say geography and privatization of the rail freight industry is why some consider it to be the most efficient in the world. The rest of the world does things quite a bit differently. In most of the rest of the world, the rail network is nationalized. It isn't owned by a particular company. The United States geography is the primary reason that freight railroad and the freight network in the United States is far superior to what you see in other countries. A lot of what railroads depend upon are bulk commodities, agricultural commodities, and mining that we get out of the ground. And a lot of those materials come from the center part of the country. And because these are going to non-populated areas, Rail is really well positioned and is a far superior mode of traffic than you see with trucks. These companies compete with each other, but also must work together and coordinate shipments since there is not one central owner of the railroad. In order for us to provide service for a customer, say from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast, we have to hand off those products, those boxes, those car loads to a different carrier on the East side of the network. Freight railroads are what I like to call the middle miles. And so when you're looking at international traffic, for example, on the, the West Coast, you have ships bringing in goods and those are transloaded either directly into train or into truck. Train takes the long miles, the middle miles of those trips, and then hands those off to, to truck often at the end of the trip. So we all work together as one overall network. Through the reduction of companies and consolidation, railroad market power has increased. They are occasionally brought up in front of the regulators for not servicing, but also not charging fair market rates. They're constantly under the lens and constantly accused of exercising more monopolistic practices in their pricing. Not so much on the intermodal traffic, which has to sort of stay naturally competitive with truck traffic, but more so on uh, the bulk goods that there isn't really a, an equivalent truck uh, competition. The Biden administration issued an executive order last July that calls for regulation on the freight industry, targeting a practice known as reciprocal switching. Reciprocal switching is intended to foster more competitive environments for shippers. Because the freight companies own certain stretches of track, the regulation would force them to open up the tracks to other freight companies, giving shippers more options of who to work with and therefore creating a more competitive market. The practice is already common in Canada, and some freight railroads have switching agreements which came as a result of previous mergers. When Amtrak was created, part of the deal was its passenger trains would still have access to tracks owned by the freight companies. Amtrak pays host railroads $142 million a year to use their tracks. It comes at a time when we're trying to move as much freight as we can throughout the supply chain and to do anything that would knowingly undermine the fluidity of the freight network is frankly wrong-headed and at odds with the overarching goal of maximizing freight movement. The system works. The Surface Transportation Board is in place to adjudicate rate disputes and determine uh, whether or not a particular rate might be reasonable or not. The Surface Transportation Board, the agency who oversees economic regulation in the industry, is holding a public hearing to discuss the matter in March. The railroad companies rely on the trucking industry, but also compete with them for customers. Truck is the biggest form of competition for railroads in North America. Trucks have an advantage on the smaller shipments that are associated more commonly with consumer products. Rails have a big advantage on what I would call bulk commodities that are heavy and move in larger quantities. Historically, a big portion of rail volumes came from moving coal throughout the country. In 2019, coal shipments were down 45% from their peak in 2006. Today, the rise of e-commerce and companies like Amazon have made intermodal containers its biggest shipment. Intermodal containers can move seamlessly from a ship to a train to a truck without having to be unpacked. We've become a more intermodal intensive industry. And so things that we hadn't done in the past as much as move smaller packages, we're doing a lot more of that. 
It gives you more breadth and more reach in terms of the customers that you can serve. The freight rail is the most environmentally friendly way to move goods over land. We emit about 25% of carbon emissions that our, our trucking partners do. One intermodal freight train carries upwards of 200 containers. And so that's 200 trucks worth of goods on one train. And for the railroads themselves, it's far more profitable. They can charge a much higher rate on a per mile basis by hauling intermodal traffic than just hauling general commodities. Los Angeles and Chicago are the two top areas in the U.S. for intermodal trains. Theft of these boxes have been on the rise recently. In L.A., Union Pacific containers carrying packages for companies like UPS, FedEx, and Amazon were found open, and a trail of empty boxes lined the tracks. A handful of years ago, theft out of an intermodal box was a, a nuisance. Happened every once in a while, wasn't organized. Today, over the course of about the last year and a half, that theft has become very well organized. We have a concentrated issue in the L.A. basin. Los Angeles ports are a crucial part of the global supply chain. The Port of L.A. and the Port of Long Beach together take in 40 percent of all goods sent to the U.S. by water. Millions of containers and billions of dollars worth of goods move through the port every year. Supply chain issues during the pandemic have led to a backup at the ports, with lots of containers waiting to move into the country. When the supply chain is facing challenges, freight railroads are facing challenges. And we've been working hard to do our part to help alleviate supply chain challenges facing this country. And that's through operating 24-7. It's through working with our maritime and our trucking partners to keep goods moving, to stand up additional capacity, and really try to keep the economy going. As the industry looks to the future, automation and the rise of self-driving truck companies like Embark and Plus could take more of the freight industry's market share. If you think about it on a per mile basis, there are estimates that an autonomous truck would actually reduce the cost of running a truck by as much as 70%. If that plays out, it's going to put significant pressure on the railroads because they simply cannot maintain high pricing and really participate in that intermodal traffic. We see an awful lot of emphasis on autonomous trucks, and I'm pretty sure within our lifetime, we'll see driverless trucks on the road. But we also then need to be able to automate the railroads to keep up with that. Union Pacific has invested in Too Simple, a self-driving truck startup, as a way to keep up with developments. It also said at the company's investor day in 2021 that ultimately our answer to autonomous trucks is autonomous trains. There are companies like Parallel Systems currently working on prototypes of self-driving trains. Of course, we're looking to be as competitive as we can in the, in the future. There's a lot of pieces that go into that, but certainly the technology and kind of the backbone of that technology, we think it we think exists and we're, we're pursuing those opportunities. Despite being the dominant mover of freight in the U.S., the trucking industry is facing a labor shortage, an issue that only grew worse during the pandemic. Labor as a percent of overall railroads is far less than what you see with the trucking industry. So autonomous is going to benefit the trucking industry far greater then it would benefit the railroad industry. And so it's a major threat to the railroads. I would fully expect that the railroads will fight through their lobbying efforts to keep autonomous trucks really boxed in and, and tightly regulated and will be a big constituent that pushes back on full autonomous. Trucking makes up 27% of jobs in the transportation industry compared to rail transportation, which makes up 3%. The rail industry declined by 40,000 jobs from November 2018 to December 2020. Railroads also have their own set of issues as it relates to labor. The unions that are fighting them on things like precision railroading, which makes the railroads far more efficient and makes the railroads far more dependable, but also means that there's less labor and humans involved in the transportation networks. Precision scheduled railroading is an operational innovation that helped turn the industry around. It adds and mixes freight cars onto longer trains for fewer trips and reduces the number of stops and crew. The unions have not particularly liked it, but shareholders of the railroads have loved it. And it's really driven the capital appreciation, the profit appreciation, and the efficiency of the railroads for the past couple decades. There's pressure to protect the jobs. The regulators have to be very, very careful that we don't end up back in the 1970s in 10 or 20 more years when the trucking industry has evolved to being highly innovative and automated and rails are 
back holding the two-man crews because the federal government has said you will have a two-man crew rule. Despite these criticisms and the number of employees in both trucking and freight rail declining, the need to transport goods around the world will not stop. The projected growth for freight volume in the U.S. is expected to grow 50 percent by 2050. And it's important that people realize that. We're out there working out on the network outside 24-7. We've done that throughout the pandemic. We've done that throughout the supply chain challenges we've seen, and we'll continue to do that into the future. This is Moynihan Train Hall at Penn Station in New York City. It's one of several stations along the Northeast Corridor, which is the busiest stretch of rail line in North America. One of the train companies that operates in this rail line is Amtrak, which is an inner city rail company that ferries passengers from one large city to another. In 2021, when this hall opened, more than 4 million Amtrak passengers came through this station. In 2019, before COVID, more than 10 million people came through Penn Station. The Northeast Corridor is also home to the fastest train in the Western Hemisphere, the Acela. It can hit a top speed of 150 miles per hour, though it usually travels at speeds slower than that. The full trip from Boston to Washington, D.C. takes about seven hours. You might notice if you try to book a ticket on one of these trains, they are expensive. Even with high ticket prices in stations like this one, Amtrak has never made money. Its status as a for-profit company owned and funded by the federal government has earned it a lot of criticism. But just before COVID, Amtrak was in its strongest financial position in history. Ridership has slowly recovered, and it has big plans to expand its service, including in fast-growing regions that are underserved. There's, I think, tremendous public sentiment for rail as a mode, and with all of the public attention on sustainability, uh, really, this is the time for rail travel. There are two basic types of passenger train in the U.S. Commuter trains, which typically travel from the center of a major city to its suburbs, and intercity trains, which, as the name suggests, offer service from one large city to another. Commuter trains are often run by local public transportation agencies, but almost all intercity trains in the U.S. are run by Amtrak. Amtrak was created in 1970 by the Rail Passenger Service Act. Its formal name is the National Rail Passenger Corporation. It was created to buy out the private passenger rail businesses then struggling to compete. Amtrak operates more than 30 routes on about 21,000 miles of track. It stops at 526 stations across 46 U.S. states, Washington, D.C., and three Canadian provinces. Amtrak can be thought of as three systems in one. There's the Northeast Corridor, a 457-mile stretch of track that runs from Boston to Washington, D.C. That is the only route that makes Amtrak money. Then there are the state-supported rail systems, which are jointly run by Amtrak and 17 states. Over 220 such trains run each weekday on 28 corridors of less than 750 miles. Those account for about 45% of Amtrak's total ridership. Lastly, there are 15 long-distance routes. All of these are at least 750 miles in length, and they range up to 2,728 miles. These are the trains that traverse broad swaths of the country. They have observation cars, sleeping cabins, and dedicated dining cars. The vast majority of passengers only ride these for a portion of the total trip. They serve a number of purposes. They connect small communities with each other and with large metropolitan areas. These trains are the only Amtrak trains in half of the states where Amtrak operates. They also are the only form of intercity passenger transportation in some of these communities. That includes buses and airplanes. Understanding these three systems is key to understanding the cost of a train ticket. The Northeast Corridor is the most heavily used portion of the system. In fact, of the about 12.1 million trips taken on an Amtrak train, about 4.4 million of those traveled through the Northeast Corridor. These heavily used Northeast Corridor routes are also the most expensive. 
we do a lot of work to study uh, what consumer willingness is to pay and also how much capacity we have for any given point in time. So our prices essentially reflect both willingness to pay and market demand in any market. But service in the lower priced areas can be a lot spottier. In some regions of the country, one of Amtrak's long distance trains might roll into a stop just once a day, often at odd hours. Delays are common. Here I'm gonna to try to book a ticket from Moynihan Train Hall at Penn Station in New York to Union Station in Washington, D.C. And I'm gonna to try to book the ticket for tomorrow. On this particular search, it is impossible to find a train ticket on either an Acela or a slower Northeast Regional train or one of the long distance trains for less than $100. All of them cost more than $100 one way. That means you're gonna pay about the same amount coming back. So the round trip ticket on the Acela is gonna cost $674 for a business class ticket. Bear in mind that first would be even more. And now on Delta, a flight leaving at nine o'clock in the morning and arriving at 10.25 a.m., so just an hour and a half later, starts at $448 round trip and $548 for first. So a first class ticket on a Delta flight round trip at around the same time would be about $100, more than $100 cheaper than the Acela ticket. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is book a ticket for a trip that's gonna be further in the future. So let's say I wanted to book a ticket on an Amtrak train around the Christmas holiday. Let's say on Friday the 23rd, and I wanna come back on Monday the 26th. So my total ticket for that trip on the Acela is gonna cost $457. Okay, now we can try the same thing with the airline tickets. So a round trip ticket leaving at 9 o'clock in the morning on December 23rd is $243 for a basic economy, main cabin. A comfort ticket is $273, and a first class ticket is only $343. Tickets on slower Northeast Corridor trains are cheaper than Acela tickets. If you think about other modes of transportation, like airlines and highways, there's a lot of federal investment that goes into infrastructure, such as airports, air traffic control systems, highways. And so when people look at Amtrak, they often think about the infrastructure that we spend money on that's required for us to operate, which really isn't seen in other modes of transportation. So airlines are not paying for their own airports, they're paying user fees, which defray costs that the federal government invested up front. Amtrak's NEC trains are also a lot more expensive than comparable systems in other countries. Fares on Amtrak's Northeast Regional trains average 70 cents per mile. That is about three times the price of a fare on a train in France or Germany. Trains in Europe also tend to be faster or tend to run more frequently or have other advantages. None of these networks is perfect. They're just much better than the American one. Amtrak's system is demand-based, meaning that prices are determined in part by the demand for tickets, the same way airline tickets are priced. Amtrak has a shortage of trains, a shortage of rolling stock with which to provide the um, highest capacity service. And this is something that especially afflicts the higher end service, the Acela. This is partly self-inflicted. Amtrak's Acela trains are essentially high-speed trains that are running on tracks that are not meant for high-speed trains. The tracks are older and curvy, which is not ideal. In order to mitigate this, Amtrak's Acela trains have a tilting mechanism that allows them to maximize their speed on curved tracks. That's not unusual. These tilting mechanisms are seen on some trains around the world. For example, in Japan, Switzerland, Spain, Italy, Germany, and Sweden. However, there are different types of tilting mechanisms, and the one that is seen on Acela trains is the most aggressive. It has been largely discontinued elsewhere, because of the high maintenance costs. At the time they were built, Acela trains were also beefed up to meet US regulations. They were so heavy, the French workers who built them called the Acela locomotive Le Cochon, the pig. That makes them even more maintenance intensive. There are 20 Acela train sets, and as of a couple years ago, 16 out of the 20 were available at a given time. So it's 80% availability, which is just not good. Um, the TGVs in France achieve high 90s. Tickets could be a lot cheaper if the trains allowed for higher capacity, but the high cost of the trains and low availability hampers that. That's why the service appeals to travelers who value time over money. 
the convenience of leaving literally from Capitol Hill in Washington and showing up in midtown Manhattan two and a half hours later, as opposed to leaving from Dulles Airport 30 miles outside of Washington and landing in LaGuardia, you know, far out on Long Island. So that convenience, actually, I think is, is something that a lot of travelers may place a premium on. Amtrak has always struggled financially. For example, it lost about $1.7 billion in the two years leading up to the pandemic. In early March 2020, Amtrak was on its way to making money for the first time in its 50-year history. But within weeks, ridership plummeted 97%. Gross ticket revenue in 2019 was just over $2.3 billion. In 2020, it fell by nearly half. Then it fell again by another 30% in 2021. Expenses in 2021 totaled $4 billion. About half of Amtrak's expenses are wages, salaries, and benefits for its roughly 17,000 employees. One of the biggest sources of expenditure is its aging fleet and infrastructure. Amtrak's diesel locomotives are about 25 years old on average, and its rail cars average 35 years. The typical useful lifespan is about 40 years. The trains are out of date mechanically, hard to find parts for, unreliable, and pretty run down. In addition, the Northeast Corridor has a $42 billion repair backlog. Amtrak would not be able to make money at the fares that trains in France and Germany make a decent amount of money on, or fares that the Japanese trains, that the Shinkansen trains, they're about 35 to 40 US cents per mile. So, so it's fares that the Japanese operators are making windfall profits on. Amtrak would not be able to make a profit on these. The biggest financial challenges we face are to recover the fare box. So in other words, to get the ticket revenue back to where it was pre-COVID and actually account for the fact that there has been considerable inflation uh, during the COVID period. So it's not just good enough to get back to where we were, but we truly have to compensate for a lot of what's been going on in terms of uh, inflation in the last few years. Amtrak expects its revenue to be relatively low in 2022 again and to have trouble covering its costs. Part of Amtrak's financial difficulty results from the need to operate three systems that perform very differently. There's the Northeast Corridor, where demand is high, even with high fares. There are the various state-supported railways, which vary in their success. State-supported routes recover about 66% of their costs through ticket revenue. That's about twice the average for public transit. Finally, there are the long-distance routes, which are the biggest money pits. They are expensive services to run. Um, you run into lots of different conflicts because you're running these, these very, very long routes. They, um, they can be hours delayed. You know, plus, we've, we've seen those horror stories before. One of Amtrak's key challenges is that outside the Northeast Corridor, the company rents tracks from freight companies. Federal law requires that freight companies give Amtrak trains priority over freight. However, the Department of Justice has not enforced this law since 1979. These right-of-way issues are the primary reason long-distance trains are delayed, and those delays drive up costs. Despite their financial troubles, the long-distance routes enjoy a lot of support. In some places, these trains are the only form of intercity transit. To a certain degree, you can take the view that they don't always cover their full operating costs from ticket revenue, but they provide a lot of services to the communities they pass through, the value of which is not really captured in a ticket price, as it were. There's been lots of calls for, for getting rid of them and eliminating them, uh, and those don't really seem to go anywhere because it does have the, these strange bedfellows that exist around um, supporting these, these services. Transportation researchers do think there is a future for rail in this country, but it may take some different forms than it has in the past. There's a lot of experimentation going on in this country, and that's actually a, a good thing when it comes to transportation. The pandemic has disrupted the way that Americans travel. That's, uh, it's hard to overstate just how, how, how transformative it's been. But what comes out of it is really what's going to be interesting. A few private operators are attempting to build various projects throughout the country, including in regions where Amtrak has less of a presence. These private projects focus on connecting cities that are what people call too far to drive and too close to fly. We've seen lots of examples in, in, in Southeast Asia and in Europe 
about 400 miles seems to be about the right distance. And we've got lots of corridors in this country um, that can take advantage of that. There is the planned 240 mile Texas Central Railway meant to connect North Texas with the greater Houston area. The planned train would be able to travel in excess of 200 miles per hour. The whole trip is projected to take 90 minutes. A company called Brightline, funded by Fortress Investment Group, is already operating between three stations in Florida. Brightline runs on tracks owned by the Florida East Coast Railway, a freight railway. A search for tickets on Brightline for a midday 40-minute trip from Fort Lauderdale to West Palm Beach revealed fares starting at $17 each way for one of its basic tickets and $37 for a premium ticket that comes with a range of extras, including rides to and from the station. Driving the same distance would take about 55 minutes. Prices are higher during rush hour. The company plans to expand its service in Florida and is planning another project called Brightline West, a service connecting the greater Los Angeles area with Las Vegas. Amtrak's expansion plan includes service along the same route. The last time Amtrak offered service between those two cities was in 1997. Brightline West plans to build its rail largely in the center of the Interstate 15 highway that runs between the two cities. This will allow it to avoid having to acquire land to build its own tracks, a major problem for other projects. It also won't need to rent track from freight companies, currently a major challenge for Amtrak. There is something that is changing, um, and if we can pull off the, the private element to it, I, I think then you'll see a lot more people. Trying to, trying to invest in those as well, because that's a real indication of the market demand that's out there right now. Some state-level programs have generated controversy. You have programs like California High Speed Rail, which famously is over budget, um, over time. It's not really delivering on the promise of taking somebody from Los Angeles to San Francisco. It's now running this inland route that's gonna stop short of those major metros. And so, you know, at the same time, you have success stories elsewhere in the country and some promising investments. You have this other project, which a lot of folks are wondering if it's ever going to be viable. Private sector investors may continue to have a role to play, but so will the government. Anything that's at national scale is going to have to be largely a public sector undertaking. We believe that open competition is healthy for everybody. It keeps us all honest in our business, and it also shows us innovation that we can share more broadly across the industry. Our interest is really in driving the rail mode to be successful in this country. There could be more public-private arrangements. I'd really like to see good partnerships between um, the public and the private sector when it comes to all, all modes of transportation, but particularly when it comes to passenger rail travel, because you know, especially if we have private investment, let's say in Texas, for example, between Dallas and Houston, people are going to get off the trains and going to want to connect to other services, right? And so you have other kind of train services in those metropolitan areas. You have robust bus service in those metropolitan areas. And so better coordination between the public and the private side will take advantage of those different investments and make the whole system run much more efficient. Amtrak has its own expansion plan, which it released in April 2021. Amtrak Connects Us, as it is called, has the ambitious goal of bringing intercity rail to 160 communities across the country, including the 50 most populous metropolitan areas. Many of the parts of the country that have grown fastest since Amtrak was founded have little to no service. The company wants to add 20 million riders to its annual total, more than doubling its 2019 ridership. That would add $800 million in revenue. We want to get more customers onto our existing services, through more frequencies, larger trains, uh, more popular services, but we also want to spread passenger rail to new parts of the country. Amtrak is positioning itself as a greener alternative to driving. It received $66 billion in funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. $22 billion is dedicated directly to the Agency for Fleet Upgrades and other system-wide improvements. $6 billion goes to the Northeast Corridor and $16 billion to state-supported railways. Last year, we hired 3,700 new employees to help us in our infrastructure projects, and, and this is part of the new spending that we're incurring to make the investment projects work. The remaining $44 billion is going to the Federal Railroad Administration, which will hand out the money in grants to various state agencies for upgrades to inner-city railway. That's more money than Amtrak has received in its entire history. 
The infrastructure bill has also provided enough funding for Amtrak to replace its entire fleet, including long-distance trains and northeast regionals. New Acelas will also be rolled out in 2023. There are other uh, assets that will be funded either directly by Amtrak or through the Federal Railroad Administration in terms of tunnels, bridges, and other infrastructure needed to operate the Northeast Corridor efficiently. The disruptions of the coronavirus pandemic have created a whole new set of opportunities for transportation. In certain parts of the country, particularly in the Northeast and in our long distance services, we're basically back to the levels of demand that we saw pre-2019. Not all of our demographic groups and customer demand groups are back to the same level, but we're seeing a lot of new customers, and this is what we find so encouraging. It's hard to say what the future is going to look like because we've just gone through this, this tremendous transformation um, when it comes to travel. But I think when we emerge from the pandemic, we're going to see that, um, that these kinds of services are, are critically important for helping the country move. Uh, and I certainly am bullish of the, the, the future of, of passenger rail service in the United States. China has the fastest and largest high-speed rail network in the world. The country has more than 19,000 miles of high-speed rail, the vast majority of which was built in the last decade. Japan's bullet trains can reach speeds of almost 200 miles per hour and date back to the 1960s. They've become a staple for domestic travel and have moved more than 9 billion people without a single passenger casualty. France began service of the high-speed TGV train in 1981, and the rest of Europe quickly followed. And high-speed rail is quickly expanding all over the world, in places like India, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iran, and Morocco. And then there's the US. The U.S. used to be one of the world's global leaders in rail, but after World War II, there was a massive shift. If you look at the United States prior to 1945, we had a very extensive rail system everywhere. It all was working great, except the number of companies in the auto and oil industries decided that for them to have a prosperous future, they really needed to basically help phase out all the rail and get us all into cars. The inflexible rails permanently embedded in cobblestones were paved over to provide smooth, comfortable transportation via diesel motor coach. General Motors, Firestone Tire, Standard Oil, and a few other companies that got together and they were able to buy up all the nation's streetcar systems and then quickly start phasing out service and literally dismantling all the systems over about a 10-year span. In the 1950s, President Dwight Eisenhower signed a bill to create the national interstate system. It allocated about $25 billion to build 41,000 miles of highways. The federal government paid for 90% of that, the states covered the final 10, and rail fell by the wayside. Can't you see that this highway means a whole new way of life for the children? And a way of life that we have a chance to help plan and, and to build. We dedicated a huge amount of dollars to building automobile infrastructure in the middle of the 20th century, and we're still kind of attached to that model of development. We went from a rail-served country to a auto-dependent nation by the 1960s. We've become a car culture, and it's hard to break out of that cycle, not to mention the fact that in our political system, we have very powerful oil lobbies, car manufacturing lobbies, aviation lobbies, all the uh, entities that the high-speed rail would have to compete with. This is the American dream of freedom on wheels. We average some 850 cars per thousand inhabitants in the U.S. In China, it's only 250. And we've never gone back. But according to some, this country's transportation ecosystem is reaching a tipping point. When you look at what's happening with the corridor development, again, states across the U.S. who are recognizing they are running out of space to expand their highways or interstates. There are limits at airports. There's aviation congestion. So what are the options? A better rail system is one and could come with significant benefits. 
It's largely an environmental good to switch from air traffic and car traffic to electrified high-speed rail. That's, that's a much lower emission way of, of traveling. When the high-speed rail between Madrid and Barcelona and Spain came into operation, I mean, air travel just plummeted between those cities and everyone switched over to high-speed rail, which was very convenient. People were happier to do it. They weren't forced to switch. They did it because it was a nicer option to take high-speed rail. There's a sort of a rule of thumb for trips that are under three or four hours in trip length from city to city. Those usually end up with about 80 or 90 percent of the, the travel market from aviation. Where rail exists and it's convenient and high speed, it's very popular. America, I think, is waking up to this idea that rail is a good investment for transportation infrastructure. One survey showed 63% of Americans would use high-speed rail if it was available to them. Younger people want it even more. Right now, the main passenger rail option in the U.S. is Amtrak. It's operated as a for-profit company, but the federal government is its majority stakeholder. Train systems reaching top speeds of over 110 to 150 miles per hour are generally considered high speed. And only one of Amtrak's lines could be considered as such. That's its Acela line in the Northeast Corridor running between D.C., New York, and Boston. One of the challenges we face is that the Northeast Corridor has a lot of curvature, a lot of geometry. We really operate Acela Express on an alignment that in some places was designed back in the 1900s. And so it really was never designed for high-speed rail. And while the Acela line can reach up to 150 miles per hour, it only does so for 34 miles of its 457-mile span. Its average speed between New York and Boston is about 65 miles per hour, which is in stark contrast to China's dedicated high-speed rail system, which regularly travels at over 200 miles per hour. But some people are trying to fix that. In 2008, California voted yes on high-speed rail. Now, a decade later, construction is underway in the Central Valley of the state. And right now, it is the only truly high-speed rail system under construction in the U.S. Ultimately, high-speed rail is a 520-mile project that links San Francisco to Los Angeles and Anaheim. That's phase one. And it's a project that's being built in building blocks. So the one behind me is the largest building block that we're starting with, this 119-mile segment. This segment will run from Bakersfield to Merced. Eventually, the plan is to build a line from San Francisco to Anaheim, just south of L.A. But as it stands, the state is almost $50 billion short of what it needs to actually do that. The current project, as planned, would cost too much and respectfully take too long. There's been too little oversight and not enough transparency. We do have the capacity to complete a high-speed rail link between Merced and Bakersfield. After Gavin Newsom made that speech, President Trump threatened to pull federal funding for the project. We'll continue to seek other funding. We hope the federal government will uh, resume funding the, uh, uh, contributing new funds to the project. I think in the future, as the federal government has uh, funded major construction of infrastructure over time, they'll again uh, direct money to high-speed rail because, in fact, it's not just California, but other states are also interested in high-speed rail systems. To complete the entire line as planned, the official estimate is now over $77 billion, and it's unclear where the money will come from. So why is it so expensive? Part of the problem in California, the big price tag is getting through the Tehachapi, very expensive tunneling, or over the uh, Pacheco Pass to get into San Jose from the Central Valley. You know, Eastern China, the flatlands of Japan where they've built the Shinkansen, all of those are settings where they have, didn't incur the very high expense of boring and tunneling that we face, so the costs are different. And a lot of the money is spent before construction can even begin. Just in this little segment here alone, we're dealing with the private property owner, we're dealing with a rail company, we're dealing with the state agency, and so just the whole coordination, then we're dealing with a utility company. Just in this very small section, we had to relocate two miles of freeway, and that was roughly $150 million per mile. So there's a lot of moving pieces to, you know, anywhere we start constructing. China is, is the place that many folks compare, they have like 29,000 kilometers of high-speed rail and 20 years ago they had none. So how have they been able to do it so quickly? And part of it is that the state owns the land. 
They don't have private property rights like we have in the U.S. You don't have the regulations we have in terms of labor laws and environmental regulations that, that add to costs. It also delays the projects. For some reason, and I've never really quite seen an adequate explanation as to why, costs to build transit or many big infrastructure projects are just dramatically higher than in other parts of the world, uh, including in other advanced countries. But the bottom line is we're really bad at, at just building things cheaply and quickly in, uh, in the U.S. in general. So it's not just rail infrastructure that is expensive all transportation infrastructure is. Just the physical investment in a freeway usually will be five to eight to 10 million per mile. But if you add seismic issues and land acquisition and utilities and environmental mitigation and remediation of soils and, and factors like that, it, it can become as high as 100 or 200 million a mile. The numbers for high-speed rail can vary, you know, anywhere from 20 to 80 million per, per mile. The big reason why America is behind on high-speed rail is primarily money. We don't commit the dollars needed to build these systems. It's really as simple as that. And it's largely a political issue. They don't have political leaders who really want to dedicate the dollars needed. There's a lot of forces in America that really don't want to see rail become our major mode of transportation, especially because it will affect passenger numbers on airplanes, it'll affect the use of autos. So you have the politics, the message shaping, and then the straight advertising. And all three of those coordinate and work together to keep America kind of focused on cars and not focused on rail. Some of the earliest support for rail came from the Nixon administration. Some of the original capital subsidies and operating subsidies for urban transit came from the Republican Party. So I think it's only more recently that maybe this has shifted that more liberal leaning folks who care about climate and a whole host of urban issues have really argued for investing very heavily in rail. If you had Democratic leadership on the Senate and a different president or potentially some leverage for a president to sign a new budget bill with some dollars from high, for high-speed rail, that could override those uh, objections from Republicans in Congress. But I think it's mostly ideological. They're big on highways. They're big on things like toll roads. They just, they don't want the government spending dollars on this kind of project. And they see it as you know, something those socialist European countries do, but not something that should be done in you know, car loving America. In my judgment, it would take a very strong federal commitment, almost sort of a post second world war interstate highway kind of large scale national commitment this is why some high-speed rail projects are trying to avoid public funding altogether. One company, Texas Central, plans to build a bullet train from Houston to Dallas without using a dime of taxpayer money. We're taking what is a laborious, unreliable four-hour drive, if you're lucky, and turning that into a reliable, safe 90 minutes. And when you look at that as a business plan dr being driven by data, this is the right place to build the first high-speed train in the United States. The Texas project is backed by investors motivated to make a profit and will use proven Japanese rail technology. Texas Central's goal is to complete the project by 2025. Another private company is even further along with its rail system in Florida. It's expanding its higher speed train from Miami to Orlando. Orlando is the most heavily visited city in the United States. Miami the most heavily visited international city in the United States. It's too far to drive, it's too short to fly. We had the rail link and that was really the genesis of the, of the project. Wes Edens has invested heavily in Florida's rail project, which used to be called Brightline. Brightline recently rebranded to Virgin Trains as the company partnered with Richard Branson's Virgin Group. The team at Brightline, uh, which is now called Virgin Trains, has proven that, uh, that, that it can work, that people actually uh, want to get out of their cars and, and they'd love to be on trains. In order to reach profitability, the company sacrificed speed to save money. If you want to really go high speed, you have to grade separate. So you basically have to build a bridge for 250 miles that you then put a train on. That sounds hard and it sounds expensive and it's both of those things. So a huge difference in cost, a huge difference in time to build, and not that much of a reduction in service. And now tech companies are getting involved with infrastructure projects. In the Pacific Northwest, a high-speed rail plan is underway to connect Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver. Microsoft contributed $300,000 towards research for the project. A number one priority for Microsoft as well is to really see and pursue this high-speed rail effort happen. 
If you look at the, around the United States, where all the Fortune 500 companies are located, they all are in a similar situation to Microsoft. The housing is unaffordable, traffic congestion is epic, it's too hard to get anywhere and to get employees. So high-speed rail can solve this same exact problem in numerous regions around the United States. So is the private sector the answer to bringing high-speed rail to the U.S.? If the private sector wants to invest in transportation, and as long as it's not you know, impinging on the public taxpayers, I don't see a problem with the private sector moving forward. And I think there is some truth that the private sector is going to have much more of an incentive to hurry up on the construction and get things done more quickly, more cheaply. That said, the private sector still has to operate with the oversight and the regulatory responsibilities of the public sector. So, for example, environmental review doesn't go away just because it's a private sector project. Uh, labor standards don't go away. The difference is that they don't have to keep trying to sell a project to the public for a vote to raise taxes or sell bonds. Some people remain optimistic that the U.S. can catch up to the rest of the world and have a robust high-speed rail system. We're building that right now behind us. Uh, this 119-mile segment that we want to expand with the money we already have to 170 miles, it's going to serve a population of 3 million people in the Central Valley. So it's not only do I believe, but it's under construction. A lot of activity is now taking shape. State rail authorities have been shaped in four or five states. So they're actually taking these on now as a legitimate project and moving forward. I think the future is very bright for train travel in the United States. There's broad consensus with our policy leaders in industry that it, it's time to move an infrastructure bill. And that will certainly help kickstart U.S. rail. Others are much less confident. I wish I were a little more optimistic. It's just very difficult to make the economics work here. No one has embraced it as a strong part of their political platform. There's just too many other tough, pressing problems we're facing. I don't see us catching up to where the rest of the world is. It would take such a massive infusion of dollars for that to happen in California and probably waiving a number of environmental requirements and some other government regulations that hinder the quick deployment of these projects in favor of other values. My own instincts are that it's going to be decades and decades and decades before you'll be able to go a one-seat trip from San Diego to Sacramento or San Francisco. It'd be nice if there was just one simple answer. It, it's this litany of factors that collectively add up that make this so hard to pull off in the United States. So.